firstly, I want to say hello to all of you. I hope you are all doing wonderful today. And secondly, this video that you're watching right now is going to be a, a little different than normal. Uh, today, I am actually going to focus on one building. We're going to talk about its residence. We're going to talk about its construction and its long, long history. You see, for 120 years, the U.S. Federal Penitentiary, Atlanta, which is this building that you see right here behind me, this building has housed some of America's worst people, some of America's most notorious people. It even housed one of its own wardens, a person who at one time was the warden of this prison, was convicted of a crime and sentenced to his very own prison. We're going to talk about all of it today, right here at the Big A, which is the, the uh, nickname for the penitentiary here in Atlanta, right after we get back from the intro. Today, we are talking solely on the U.S. Penitentiary, Atlanta. The USP stands for United States Penitentiary, just because you might hear me reference that several times throughout this video. The, the actual history of this prison is quite fascinating. I, I didn't know that some of the stuff that had happened here has happened here, as I imagine a lot of you probably have it. We're gonna learn it today. We're gonna talk all about it. We're gonna learn it all. Like I say on the Space Channel, you learn something new every day. So we're gonna try to learn something new today. To get the full history of the Big A, which like I said, that's the nickname for the prison here. We first have to go back in time to the 1870s. The federal government at that time, they only had about 1,500 convicted inmates in their possession. So with that few people, they just paid uh, state jails and county jails to house those inmates. Well, fast forward about 10 years later, that number had doubled. So the federal government decided that it was time that they had their own prisons. In 1891, Congress passed the Three Prisons Act which provided the funding necessary for three facilities across the United States. One in the East, one in the Midwest, and one in the West. The Midwest prison would be the first built. That's Leavenworth in Kansas. Next would be the prison in the East, which was obviously chosen here in Atlanta. And the third prison built would be uh, the United States Penitentiary McNeil Island, which is in the state of Washington. Obviously, because we are in Atlanta, this video today we're gonna focus solely on the US Penitentiary here in Atlanta. And I, this has nothing to do with the prison, but I'm just noticing this as I'm standing here filming, and I just happen to look up and glance across the street. There is a tree that has fallen right through the middle of a van over there, a big, Ford van and a tree just fell right through the middle of it, completely crushing it. I didn't notice that in, until I was standing here talking. That's crazy. Now the federal government, they chose this 300 acre site here that the, the prison sits on. They chose this for the prison because of its proximity to what they thought was important to them at the time. So uh, for example, the prison is only one mile away from downtown Atlanta, so they have easy access to medical facilities and, uh, you know, if they need to make supply runs to go to stores, that kind of thing. The prison here is also only one mile away from the federal courthouse, so they can transport people back and forth very easily. Also, they chose this spot because 
of its proximity to the railroad. Uh, on the back side of the property, the railroad tracks like run right up next to the prison and they even have tracks that run onto the property of the prison and they use that to uh, actually offload a prisoner that we'll talk about later in the video. So um, those are the reasons why they, they chose this spot here for the prison to sit on. They used the exact same architect to draw up the plans for their prisons, which is why uh, the, the U.S. Penitentiary here in Atlanta, uh, Leavenworth, and the penitentiary in Washington, McNeil Island, is why they all kind of look the same with the, uh, the graystone, classical, cathedral-style uh, architecture. The government wanted everything to be on a grand scale, appearance-wise anyways. Um, and that was to try to intimidate anyone who was going to be walking inside of this building. So uh, they designed it to, to have two massive cell houses on either side of a grand entrance. As you can see, the grand entrance is right here in the center, the entranceway into the prison, and then to this side over here is a cell house, and then this side over here would be a cell house. The size of the prison and the surrounding walls, they were made to play psychological games on prisoners. They wanted uh, anyone who was imprisoned here to feel small and insignificant. So everything was built on massive levels. They also used this technique all around the country with any prison they built around this time period. They also used it when they were building uh, psychiatric hospitals or psych wards all over the country. Anything built around that time, they, they tried to build them on a grand scale to, to make people feel little. It was all to mess with your head, but pretty much. It was all to mess with your head. They broke ground here on the site in early 1900. The builders were all prisoners of uh, the federal government. They had brought from all over the country and other who, you know, people who were uh, convicted inmates of the federal government. They actually only had a few skilled craftsmen that were actually on hand to oversee the construction. They were all prisoners. While building the cell houses, they actually uh, had makeshift tents set up right out here in front of the building that the prisoners stayed in while they were doing the construction. Also, the only prisoners selected to, to build this were prisoners who were serving life sentences and uh, at the same time, they were not paid to do any of this construction. By 1902, the first set of cell houses over here were complete. At that time, the prison had 347 inmates who lived in the cell house over there while they were doing the construction on the cell houses on this side. Those first 347 inmates, it, it was a massive mix of people. Like uh, inmate number 19, his name was John Ross and he was serving a life sentence for murder. He actually died inside of this prison. Inmate number 31, his name was Alfred Cheney, and he was in for 10 years for robbing a post office. Now, in the early days, this prison was super, super strict. They wore the black and white pinstripe uniforms at all times. Their hair was mandatory. It had to be cut short to control lives. And if you broke a rule, you were hit with a billy club, and then you were handcuffed to the door of your cell for days at a time, depending on the severity of your crime. Now, punishment in America was a lot different then than it is now. Nowadays, that would be considered cru cruel and unusual, but back then, that was a normal thing. Once they completed the second set of seal houses, they began work on the wall, the perimeter wall around the building. Every morning for seven straight years, all of the inmates were marched outside to build that outer perimeter wall. The inmates of the time worked all day with only a few meal breaks and they were offered no variety of food. It was like the same thing, sandwiches and it, like every day. By the time they were finished, the outer wall was 39 feet tall, four feet thick, 
and more than 4,000 feet long. It was the largest cement and masonry project in America of its time. The wall is massive. It is ridiculously massive. It's huge. It's, it's ridiculous. There's over 5,000 tons of concrete in it and over 25,000 tons of granite inside of the perimeter wall. It is a beast. You can see uh, how massive that giant wall is around the prison pretty good from this side. They definitely wanted to make sure no one got out and no one got in. Um, besides the forced haircuts and the forced hard labor, the first warden of the prison, William Moyer, he also enforced a silent rule. The prison had to remain quiet at all times or you were punished. The prisoners couldn't talk. They could not, uh, they couldn't speak even when in their cells. They could not speak while they were in the lunchroom having uh, lunch. They couldn't talk at all. Conversations were only allowed if a prisoner was speaking to a guard about something or if they were outside in the yard. Not working now. If you were working, you could not talk. But if you were just out uh, on recreation time or something like that, you could talk. As long as you did not use any profanity. They also, uh, they could not have any visitors at that time because of the construction. They feared that people, prisoners would try to escape. So they had no visitors and they could only write letters once a month. Now because they couldn't speak while they were eating, they had hand signals that they used while they were inside the cafeteria. So say for instance, if they raised their right hand, it meant they wanted more bread. If they raised their fork, it meant they wanted more meat. If they raised a knife, it was more vegetables. And if they raised their spoon, it meant they wanted more soup. At the same time, it was really tough on the, the prisoners. It was also tough on the guards. They worked uh, sometimes 12 hours a day, seven days a week, and they were only paid $70 a month. In 1912, the, uh, the warden of the time eventually kind of loosened his grip a little bit, and he allowed them to build a baseball field in the back of the property that, uh, as far as I know, still is still on property to this day. Also, in 1912, to kind of boost the prisoner's morale, they started a newspaper, which is still in production to this day. Um, now, did you know that a gentleman who was incarcerated here at the Atlanta Penitentiary, he actually ran for president while he was inside of the prison here. That's right. In 1918, a uh, political spokesperson named Eugene Debs. He was uh, he was big on in, in the uh, Socialist Party. He was arrested by the federal government and sentenced to 10 years here at the federal penitentiary in Atlanta. But his party didn't forget about him. They knew, and and he was wildly popular. So it, during the 1920 presidential race. He was part of it, and even though a lot of the a lot of the stuff went on by people outside of the prison, he ran his campaign from inside of the prison. Now, he uh, he was not elected to be president. In fact, Warren Harding won that election that year. But after Warren Harding took office, he actually uh, pardoned Debs, and on Christmas Day, December. 25th of 1921, Eugene Debs was released from the penitentiary here in Atlanta. By 1923, the prison had reached twice its supposed running population. There was 2,800 inmates inside of the prison at that time. Be because there were so many people in there, the rule that, that made it so that the, everybody had to stay quiet inside the prison. They really couldn't enforce it anymore. There, there were too many inmates over the number of guards to enforce it. So the prison was no longer silent. The warden of the prison at that time was a man named Albert East Artain. Because of the massive amount of inmates that were on the property, Albert East Artain had a new power plant and water facility added here to the property. 
over here where this smokestack is is their power station that was added it wasn't long after that though that the ward and albert east artane was investigated by the fbi for taking bribes he was allowing prisoners to actually leave the penitentiary here and go into town and have parties and then come back and he got caught so he was arrested and convicted and they the federal judge actually sentenced him here to his own prison so the once warden of the atlanta penitentiary was brought in fingerprinted and marched down the halls into his very own cell inside of his very own prison it's crazy now we talked about the train tracks that actually go onto this property they were utilized in 1932 when america's biggest gangster america's biggest i mean he was famous too at the same time uh but he was america's biggest mobster his name was al capone in 1932 they uh the federal government were finally able to capture al capone and it, it was just on a uh, tax evasion charge but they were trying anything and everything they could to get him off the streets well so he was charged with tax evasion and he was sentenced here to the federal penitentiary in atlanta well because he was such a high profile prisoner they did not want to transfer him between vehicles into the building or anything like that so they brought him in by train they pulled his train car right in to the property and uh, off loaded him on property while al capone was here on site his prisoner number was 40886 and he was assigned duties in the shoe shining shop or a shoe repair shop so he fixed shoes and and uh, clean shoes for the other prisoners in 1934 though there were reports that he was still running his criminal enterprise from behind these walls here at the penitentiary and he was immediately shipped out of the penitentiary here and they shipped him to alcatraz in san francisco by 1940 america had entered the war effort and uh that meant that that prisons started their own you know helping in the war effort so whereas the atlanta penitentiary made u.s postal bags prior to that point they began making tents and tank covers and mattresses they were able to produce about 10,000 mattresses a month out of this prison over the years uh the prison has had additions uh you can see the main prison there with the with the walls around it and everything those were the main prison walls that were erected in 19 between 1900 and 1910 and then the prison expanded outward after that now these houses that you see out here at one time were guard houses guards or, or prison officials uh lived in these houses at one time obviously as you can see now these they all sit abandoned they appear that they have been abandoned for some time in 1943 the cia came to town and they actually came here onto the prison facilities and they began doing medical testing on inmates inmates volunteered to to do medical testing on L on lsd on anti-malarial drugs all different kind of stuff it, it only lasted a few years before uh some prison officials were accused of coercing inmates into the program before that that whole thing was shut down and as far as anyone knows they've never tested on any of the inmates here ever again it's kind of uh just being outside of, we're on public sidewalk here but just being outside of the prison uh you can see the guards and the towers there they're just they're pacing back and forth and uh obviously watching everything that we're doing they know everything that we're doing out here again though we're on a public sidewalk we have not entered the property we've not done anything to make them nervous they obviously uh they just automatically get that way in 1957 
Rudolph Abel was sentenced here to the Atlanta Penitentiary. He was the uh, the Russian spy who was captured, sent, he was sentenced here, and then he was traded to Russia for the U-2 pilot who was shot down, uh, Francis Gary Powers. And then in 1963, they made the decision to close Alcatraz. Those remaining prisoners were all transferred here to Atlanta, including the uh, very popular LA gangster, Mickey Cohen. Uh, there was a movie made about him several years back now. By the 70s, this prison, it was 80 years old and it was outdated. It was overcrowded and it was out of control on the inside. It all spilled over in 1987 when they had a massive prisoner riot here inside the building. The refugees rioted and took hostages at the Atlanta Detention Center today. The place was set on fire, buildings were destroyed, one inmate was left dead and the FBI had to come in in full riot gear go in and take back control of the prison. Since then the United States Penitentiary Atlanta has underwent massive massive upgrades to bring it into the modern century. Uh, they built new cell houses, new admin buildings, a state-of-the-art security system new power stations and water stations. Atlanta, the, the United States Penitentiary here in Atlanta, is it's going to remain open for a long time. And there's no plans on closing it anytime soon. Now, present day, it has made its way back into the news again because uh, there's been a couple people who have cut holes in the fence on the back side of the property and actually escaped. And then they would return with liquor and uh, cigarettes and all kind of contraband that they weren't supposed to have. It's also made its way into the news recently because they had a really big problem here with people flying drones over the top of the prison and dropping packages down inside. I mean, it sounds like something that's right out of a movie, but it's true. There was a real big problem with it. And now this facility has a state-of-the-art drone warning system. So uh, not only is it... If I were to try to launch the Mavic from right here, it would not allow me to launch. It would tell me it's a no-fly zone. And if by chance someone were to get around that, the prison would know a long time before a drone even got close to it. The prison would know about it. And it would either be shot down or, you know, you could actually be arrested for those type things. And you get alerts like this weekly. At least once a week, yes. We know that's the Sky Fox drone that authorities invited us to use as a test. We were just the latest to get this view, but the first to do so without trying to drop a payload of contraband inside the fence line. Over the years since the prison riot, all of this barbware has been added around this elaborate uh, main entrance here to the prison. And that is because uh, there was a prisoner who tried to escape through one of these upper windows. So, uh, they just covered the place in barbed wire. And uh, they haven't had any escape attempts from the building there since. That is gonna do it for here in Atlanta, Georgia at the United States Penitentiary, USP Atlanta. Thank you all so much for watching. I really appreciate it. If you're new here, go down, click that subscribe button, hit that notification bell so you get notified when I upload a video. If you want to help support the channel, check out the links in the description box below. Thank you all so much. I will see you again tomorrow. Please stay safe and stay healthy.